Welcome to another episode of One on One with Mitch LaFawn. I'm your host, Mitch LaFawn, joined by fellow podcaster of Talking Metal, Mark Striegel. And Mark has a few yes. things he'd like to say. Yes, definitely, Mitch. I'm excited because we have big news here on One on One with Mitch LaFawn. You, sir, are on iHeartRadio. So congratulations, man. Thank you. I'm, I'm very, very excited about that because, you know, iHeart is one of these platforms that's very successful. They, they, they have a lot of, you know, to use big words, market penetration. And to get approved on iHeart, you actually have to have some numbers, have some credibility. And so to get there, it's just very rewarding. It, it just shows that the job you're doing of putting the shows together and the job I'm doing of getting the interviews is something they like. And, and you know, congratulations to you, too, because without you, this wouldn't get done. So... Well, thanks, man. I'm, I'm thrilled yeah. to be a part of it. And while we're talking about distribution of the show, I just wanted to mention that your iTunes feed, yes. episode 42, uh, what we called episode 42 of One on One, was technically Metal Raps number one. Yes. So just uh, you guys may have already heard it. If you haven't, go back to One on One episode 42 and check it out. This is basically a new show that Mitch and and Mitch myself and <laughs> Mitch and Mitch and Mitch, Mark, yeah, Triple M have, have launched, and it's a shorter show. I think that we're going to try to keep them to 15 minutes. The first one ended up being slightly longer than that. 20. But basically, Mitch talks to us. Mitch and Mark, about what we've been up to on Talking Metal and on One on One with Mitch LaFon. We kind of talk about some of the interviews we've done and who we've spoken to and just kind of shoot the shit, if you will. Yeah, and it also sort of, it's just, it, it sort of also recaps, uh, you know, the highlights of the podcast that we're doing. And, and sometimes when you're doing interviews, you don't really get to step back and discuss the artist's album the way you see it or their shows the way you see it. And this is sort of an unfiltered look at the artist and what they're promoting. And we're joined by, of course, Mitch um, Joel, who has his own very successful podcast called Six Pixels of Separation. And you can also follow him on Twitter at Mitch Joel. Uh, he's got over 70,000 followers, which I always find very impressive. Wow. But, yeah. but, you know, uh, for those who don't know Mitch, the other Mitch, he was there at the beginning of Brave, Wor Brave Words and Bloody Knuckles. And, you know, he's partied with Lemmy, and he's been on the road with this guy and that. He's done it all, and uh, it's just great to have him on board. And he's just an absolute fantastic host. If you go back and listen to Metal Raps, he moves it along. He has a good point of view. He asks the pertinent questions. I quite enjoyed that first uh, episode, quite frankly. I did, too, and I thought it was a great start, and I can only think it's going to get better. But definitely started out great. Yeah, it really did. So why don't we get right into today's episode? Because it's, it's a bit of a long one. It's a, it's an hour interview, so I don't want to take up too much time in the in the preamble. Uh, it's Eric Scott, and some of you saying, "Hmm, all right, well, who's Eric Scott?" Eric Scott was the bass player for Alice Cooper in that what a lot of people call the Lost Era. He joined Alice's band for the Flush the Fashion tour. And then stuck around for Special Forces and Zipper Catches Skin. And uh, it's just an interesting take on the Alice Cooper history. Because we always talk about, oh, you know, Billion Dollar Babies and, and, and the early band and Neil Smith and so on. And then we talk about the later years. Oh, he, he did that song Poison and he had Bon Jovi write a song. But we never talk about those years that it was sort of like neither here nor there. And Eric was there and so it was good to hear him talk about that and of course he has a new album called and the earth bleeds which you can get on amazon and cd baby and all that wonderful stuff so you know uh by the way uh, mark were you a fan yeah. of those alice cooper days i wouldn't say i would i was a fan you know i i had flushed the fashion actually on vinyl <laughs> it wasn't one of my favorite albums, I, I will admit, but it was uh, it, it was an Alice album, and I, I definitely had it. I think I actually bought it. I don't. You remember the cutout bins where they oh, put the yeah. uh, <laughs> those dollar bins with the, uh, the the corners nipped off by a scissor? Yeah, a lot of you younger people probably have no idea what we're talking about. But sometimes when an album didn't do as well as they were expecting, they would. Uh, put them in the cutout bins, and I don't know if they would send back the corner to the label and get partial Proof. credit or how that would how that would work well, but you know what think of it for those who are younger 
when you go to Walmart these days, they've got those big buckets of DVDs that they sell for like four ninety nine of movies that just nobody cares about. Right. It's the same thing, but with actual vinyl albums and eventually with CDs. But CDs, they actually would drill a hole through the uh, case, which was annoying. Yeah. But, but yeah, you know, uh, like you, I was a fan of Alice Cooper. I loved Welcome to My Nightmare. You know, and, I, and those were the days when I had the first Cheap Trick album and, and Love Gun and from Kiss. And, and then in those early 80s, uh, I, just, I just didn't follow. And then when... Uh, what was the one? Um, not Poison. What's what was the album called? Um, Trash. Trash. Yeah. Yeah. When Trash came out, that's when I started going backwards in the '80s and picking up uh, Constrictor, Raise Your Fist and Yell, and I finally worked my way back to those albums. And now I like them. I don't think I would have liked them in 1980 or '81 or whenever they came right. out. So, but it was interesting to to hear uh, Eric talk about those years and and being there because it's it's really sort of this hidden history of alice yeah, for some reason absolutely and, and he, it looked like alice was on the verge of of dying quite frankly he looked waif like very very thin emaciated he didn't look healthy and if you can i guess you can go to youtube or whatever look at his um tom snyder interview uh, i mean it's, it's like a corpse talking it, it's it's very disturbing so so yeah. let's uh Let's, let's just turn it over to Eric and see what he has to say. Right on. We are talking with Eric Scott, who uh, once played with Alice Cooper, the Alice Cooper band, and uh, oh, so many other things. Uh, how are you doing, Eric? I'm doing really good. Thank you, Mitch. Yeah, how are you doing? I'm, I'm doing great. Now, you've done, you were, you know, I got you on the phone today because I really want to talk about the Alice Cooper history that you're involved with. But, uh, you know, I'm looking at your song credit, songwriting credits. You have songs that have appeared with Ted Nugent, Triumph, Kim Carnes. As a Canadian, why don't we start off with uh, the Triumph song? It was for the Surveillance album. Yeah. Well, in truth, I was we were I was writing for a group. I was writing with a guy from Montreal, as a matter of fact, tiny Canadian, a, a songwriter, Mark Baker. He was actually a more songwriter. He, he was a lawyer who who had gotten his law degree and now wanted to write. And, and he was an excellent writer, by the way. He's now writing for the House of Lords and a lot of stuff. Anyway, wow. we were writing songs for this album, a group that later became Signal. Right. And we hadn't got the record deal yet. So, And he knew some of the guys in Triumph. So he sent him a couple of our demos. One was Running Into the Night and one was Go. Uh, and they picked their favorite parts from both of those songs, I think, kind of combined them, wrote a few words, and uh, came out with their song called uh, Running in the Night, which which kind of, uh, which, I guess it's a co-write, it's a collaboration, it's a, a, a mashup, but uh, I hadn't the uh, pleasure of meeting any of the guys, and, but it was written with a, a Montreal co-writer, and that's, that's kind of how that ended up on a Triumph record. Yeah, and Surveillance is, is a great album. It's sort of the one in late 80s that put them back on the map. They had sort of disappeared from the consciousness for a while. But, uh, you know, and of course, uh, same same story with Ted Nugent on the Little Miss Dangerous album. You have a song? Well, yeah, a little bit. That was I was just writing with some guys in L.A. We wrote a song called, uh, I'm not sure, I can't remember what it's called on the, uh, the, the Ted Nugent album. It was called I Love How You... It's called Body Talk. I love how you move when your body talks, or something like that. And it was a rock song we were writing. It turns out I knew Dave Amato a little bit, who was playing with Ted at the time. And one of the co-writers knew, had a connection with Ted and sent him the song. And he changed it a little bit and put it on his record. Again, I, I hadn't, didn't met, meet Ted at that time either, as many of these things happen. But uh, so that's how you know, I ended up co-writing a song on a Ted Nugent record. You know, that, that is funny that you mentioned that because a lot of folks will say, oh, you wrote with so-and-so. You must know him. You must be able to get me on a guest list. You, he, you know, but that's not how the songwriting process works, does it? Frequently. I mean, sometimes if you're in the same town like the L.A. community or the New York or New Orleans, you have the pleasure of knowing these people and you can get together and kick ideas around. Or it will have been set up a writing session with publishers or a label and you'll get together for that express purpose, and you'll meet, and you become friends, and that's great. But many times it will happen like this. You'll have the song that you wrote with this other fellow, 
and he knows this guy who knows this guy, and he send, sends them to the manager of Ted Newton, and they like that song, and they're looking, they're just recording a record, and they need a song, and you never meet the guy, and there it is. I mean, at one time, Pop Staples was, I had a friend who was producing the Pop Staples record, who was trying to get songs on it with Mavis, and he invited me by, it was in Chicago, during a Sonia Dada period, and I went by, and I called out this groove and this thing simply with a, and uh, and I'd never met them. But then he, then this fellow who wanted to produce or was producing Pop Staples, Pops and Avis came by. He played them some songs. One of them was my track. They loved that. They made it. They wrote some words, and it was a title track on his father, father, which won a Grammy. And I didn't meet Mavis until later, but I had never met Pops. So, you know, yeah. you know, when they say, you're my best friend, Pops, me, you know, we go way back. Well, sometimes it's not the case. I didn't have the pleasure of meeting him. Yeah, you know, and well, you, you mentioned the band Sonia Data. Well, we'll talk about them in a bit, too. But let's get to why we're on the phone today. Alice Cooper. Now, you were in there during the Flush the Fashion Special Forces and Zipper Catches Skin Tour. And a lot of people refer to that as the lost Alice or the lost generation or the lost years. And, and you sort of take, uh, I don't want to say offense to that, but you're willing to say it's not the lost years. Well, I started hearing that 10 or 20 years later, you yeah. know, I was with the lost years. And I'm going, I'm sorry. And as I mentioned to you, I could, I started thinking about that lost from once, what, from what standpoint was it lost? Because I remember in 1980, the first, year when I started touring behind their Flush the Fashion record, uh, they had, I mean, the Alive management was on the road, and they would, at one point, they proudly opened Billboard magazine, and, and Alice was number three, was the number three box draw that summer of touring, at that point in time, anyway, and I went, well, that's kind of not being lost. And the following <laughs> year, right. I remember in 81, we played, ho on Halloween, we played Detroit, the Joe Lewis Arena, and as you know, Detroit and Phoenix both are kind of hometowns to Alice, and on Halloween, especially uh, on an Alice Cooper show, so that it was thirty-one thousand people two nights in a row in Halloween, and you know that made the. So I'm thinking it, to me and to apparently, uh, you know, thirty-one thousand people a night. He's not lost at all, so I'm not sure. You know, I kind of took offense to that, I, and I started thinking about that, and I go, well, they weren't all big shows. There was festivals, but on on an average, I'd have to say it was probably sometime between somewhere between six and eight thousand, and then not counting the big shows, and never anything less than four thousand. And uh, so I go, I don't know. It's a, yeah, it's a little insulting. The lost years. Now I know that there was uh, some problematic relationships between the label at that point in time and Alice or Alice's management, and uh, so and if a record label wants to lose your record. To that extent, there you know the record can get lost, so to speak, but in the promotion of it, so you can kind of disappear. But from a live performance standpoint, you can have you know it was a hot, strong, raw band, and uh, it wasn't lost at all. It was like you know the American Indians; they weren't lost when Columbus found them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's a bad analogy. <laughs> no, but I, but I guess the point is is that the lost era refers mostly to the music, other than the song Clones. Pretty much the other songs are hard to think of for the non-fan. I mean, you know, for somebody who's not a die-hard, 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 they're not running around going, "Oh, uh, do you know that Skeletons in the Closet song?" Right? They, they, yeah. So, so they're like, "Okay." Well, there, I guess there's there's two things happening there. You could say, "Well, it's not a classic Alice Cooper song." Maybe it isn't. But the classic Alice Cooper song all got on the radio, and the radio can make a song a classic song. Right. It's like the name of a band. You know, it doesn't really matter. If the song is cool, then the band's name is all of a sudden cool. When I first heard the Box Tops, you remember them? I think I heard of them. Yeah, sort of. Yeah, it was way back. I'm sorry, but they it was, uh, the Box Tops. And I'm thinking cereal breakfast suit. I thought it was awful, and then their version of the letter came out, and the music was great. So the the name was great. So I mean, they suffered. If it gets on the radio and it's a, a pretty good song, then and then it starts. Then it gets into the live shows, and then all of a sudden, it's a everybody remembers it, and it's a classic song. But if it doesn't get any airtime on the radio, sometimes it doesn't make the shows, and all of a sudden, it's you know, it's lost. It's lost. Yeah. So let's so let's look at how you got. Okay. So you know, flush the fashion was 
released. You weren't on the album, correct? Right. I was in England doing, well, it's another story. <laughs> well, we, we might have to set up another interview for that story. But uh, <laughs> how, does, uh, how does management or Alice get in touch with you to bring you in on the tour? And, and if you can sort of refresh my memory, was Davy Johnson at the time there? He was, I met him several times. He played on the record, the following record, which was Special Forces. Right. And we rehearsed and played. And he was a, but he a wasn't great on guy. The, okay. I, no, he wasn't in that. Well, how it happened is I came back from uh, England where I was working, doing some recording. And uh, I had done an album with Peter McKeon. And, uh, and I got a call from Dwayne Hitchings, quite simply, saying that Alice Cooper was putting a band together. And I saw Alice's show, Welcome to the Nightmare Tour, in 76, and I just oh. thought that was... I mean, no. I mean, that was a yeah, remarkable classic. It took rock and roll touring a live show to another level. Anyway, I said, sure, let's go down. So I went down with some other guys, that Mike Panera, Dwayne right. Hitchings, myself, uh, and uh, Ross Salamone on drums, and Snuffy Walden who didn't, you know, we all got, ended up being in the band, and Mike, uh, Freddie Mandel, uh, the guitar piano player, stayed with the band, so Snuffy Walden uh, didn't get that particular gig. I think I got the right name, Snuffy, and anyway, but he ended up writing all the music for TV, you know, he does the West Wing and all those things, so he's done well. But it was simply, Dwayne Hitchens calls up and says, Alice is looking for a new band, you want to go down with a couple of the guys. I said, okay, let's go down. So we, we, you know, we got together one afternoon for an hour, and we learned four songs, and then we went down there and played them and got the gig. Now, how was Alice at the time? You know, you mentioned the Welcome to My Nightmare tour, which was sort of his big moment, and Alice Cooper goes to hell and all that. But after that, from the inside, numbers started to drop. Flush to Fashion... Okay, Clones was a bit was a big single, but the album wasn't, you know, firing on all cylinders like he would have hoped. Tell me a little about about Alice's state of mind and the tour. Well, a tour was great. Like I say, we went out and that was the for a while there was number three in Billboard magazine box office, and the band that band was had as much raw rock energy as you could hope for. It was. From that standpoint, it was a, it was a great band, and so we did great shows. And his attitude was always upbeat, okay, always positive, always. And uh, he, he from each show, he was never down. You never had to talk him into you know getting up or psychologically you know come on. No, he was he was a trendsetter in that from that standpoint, and he was always gave great shows. And uh, from a musical stand, from a personal standpoint, and I got to know him fairly well because you know we co-produced the next record and. I kind of, you know, functioned a bit as a music director with him and a liaison with the band. And so I got to know him pretty well. From a musical standpoint, you know, he was a leader. And as many artists like to do, they reinvent themselves a bit as they go along. And they don't want to do the same thing that they just did. Although fans may go, that last album was so great. Can we have another one of those, please? The, you know, the musician so often will go, well, uh, they're writing songs and they're getting ready to make the next record and they go, well, we just, that sounds like the last record. We just did that. We've already done that. So, you know, he wanted to move along and uh, and change it. That Clones song which you mentioned, now that was distinctly non-classic Alice. Yeah. It was kind of new wavy and stuff. And he uh, still plays it today. Yeah. Uh, well, it got on the radio. It was a bit of a hit and it, it was timely from a cultural standpoint, you know, the clones, the robotics, the that whole thing has, resonates a little bit from a cultural standpoint, I think. And so he enjoyed that. But it was also, he got, it was a single that got some radio play, so uh, he it's safe to play that live. But he was always forward thinking on, on the following album. I mean, excuse me, the one following Special Forces. He just wanted to be re. This was at 1980, 81, 82, where he really wanted to be. He was looking at the punks and the new waivers, right. and it could arguably said that he was one of the original punks from a certain standpoint. Yeah. Nobody was more punkish. Than I can that. agree with that. But but how well, was how was he doing physically around the flush the fashion tour? Because we know that as we get into special forces and zipper catches skins, 
he he looked so emaciated and so unhealthy that people were starting to think this guy's going to die on stage. So so how was he doing when you joined the band? Um, he seemed fine. Okay, you know he was slender. His, his eating habits, and he he, he was play, he was playing some golf. I, you know, I can't tell you about his eating habits because I didn't hang with him off stage or or out of the music uh, environment. That's so interesting. Sure you, you, his... you didn't hang out. You didn't. They didn't. The band didn't hang out together. Um, Alice kept to him more to himself than okay. uh, than uh, than the normal band hanging together all the time during that period. Did you did you hang out with the other members? Where now? Uh, Mike Panera was there when you were there, correct? Yeah. And um, who else was there? Uh, Dwayne Hitchens. Yeah, Dwayne Hitchens was keyboards. So, so did the band hang out together, or did you all sort of just go your separate ways and just sort of show up on stage? Oh, we hung. We were on the same bus. Okay. So was Alice. So okay. everybody was on the same bus. So there's only just so much distance you can get. When you get to the hotel, sometimes people have to try to get some sleep. You know, you sleep when you can. So people go to their room and sleep. And then sometimes you get together at the sound check. There's not as much downtime on tour as, as people think. might think to have uh, to go to the movies or to go to play the golf. Sometimes it's a matter of survival. After the show, and by the time you wind down, you get on the bus and you wind down. It's 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning and you get a few hours. Then you pull into the next hotel and you drag yourself to the to the room, and then between demands of interviews and sound checks, you try, you, you know, you can, you eat and sleep when you can. Yeah, I know, it's, 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 it's quite an adventure. So, moving out from the tour, you start working with him on the Special Forces album. Hello? Yeah, you there? Yeah, that was oh. a, a, my incoming call disrupted us for a little bit. Oh, I apologize. So, after the, uh, the, the tour... You start working with Alice on the Special Forces album. Mm-hmm. Um, tell me a little bit about the working process there. What was he going for? Was there any discussion of we need to sound more like what's going on, which was at the time, you know, the knack and uh, the cars and that, that kind of thing? Or was he just saying, I need to make a an Alice Cooper record? You know, at that point... When after the Flush the Fashion tour and before the next album, um, I didn't uh, I didn't hang with him much, and I'm not sure all the other musicians did for a little bit. That was the summer of 1980. I went to Australia and produced a record, Sharon O'Neill in Australia, and then came back, and uh, I'm not sure what was going to happen. And then uh, apparently Dwayne had been writing and submitting songs to Alice, and then later he says, "Yeah, he's going to do." He's going to do a record. Um, so, I, yeah, I wasn't a part of any premeditated planning sessions for the material on Special Forces. Okay, now, but you were a songwriter on the album. I wrote a couple songs, yeah. We got together with some guys and submitted a couple pieces. Dallas, me and Panera uh, got together one afternoon and wrote what became Vicious Rumors. And then me and Craig Crafts, the drummer on Special Forces, got together with some people and wrote uh, you want, something you got... that became I Like Girls. Which, I like girls. Where did that come out? Where or when or what? Yeah, where and when did that come out? That's on Special Forces. I like girls. Oh, no, now. I'm no. sorry, that's on Zipper. No, you've got, uh, on uh, on Special Forces, there's uh, Vicious Rumors, and you want it, you got it. Correct? Ah, uh, did I? I got a credit, and you want it, you got it? Yes, you do. Must be the Canadian version's. <laughs> you want? Oh yeah! Oh yeah! Okay, you're right. You're right. We started a little something, me and Craig, and and uh, and uh, and Eric Kaz, a fellow a writer, and took it to Alice. And uh, you're right. And me became you got it. You want? It, you got it. Which was maybe a little in its eighth approach, a little clones-ish in that it was kind of a yeah, an eighth eighth vibe, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> the 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 I like girls is on is on the next album, Zipper Catches Skin. Right, you're right. And uh, you did a lot of writing on that one, but but let's look at the Special Forces album for 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 a moment. So, yeah, you know, you've you've done this songwriting. You go out on tour. How was the tour on that in that era? On Special Forces? Yeah. Oh, that was great. 
Now, now, so to backtrack, so I first joined Alice, and we're on tour, and we're doing the flush to fashion stuff. Then after that, people go their ways. I've yet to make any recordings with him, as have many of those members, and so we go our ways. And then it turns out he's making a record, we get, so we get back together and finish the record. Now we're going to tour it, as you say, the Special Forces. And he comes up with, a, this is during the... Um, the Afghanistan was the hostage situation. Was it right. Iran? Or? Well, Iran. Uh, well, that was uh, that was that was nineteen seventy nine, nineteen eighty, wasn't it? And then the Afghanistan was uh, the Russians invaded Afghanistan, and so that this was probably around the time of the Olympic boycott and and all that wonderful stuff. Well, it's because I remember somebody asked me about. He called the band occasionally "Hostage Fever," <laughs> and that was. <laughs> And that was because of the uh, the uh, oh, but the you're right. The uh, the American hostage thing went on uh, for 440 days. So it started in I think end of '79 and worked its way all through 1980. I guess. Yeah, would well, they have to, huh? Yeah. So he was. I guess he was feeling militant, and uh, that's why the special forces. And he came up with that great logo that was the the backdrop on stage, the special forces. A logo and the, with the skull and the beret, uh, which was very cool. And the tour was great. And uh, that was the one that, you know, it sold 31,000 twice in a row over in Detroit. And things were going great. And uh, the look, the stage look of the band, it was a cross between uh, the end of the river scene in uh, Apocalypse Now and, and the alley scene in West Side Story. So it was a real good vibe, and everybody got into it. And uh, Spirits were high in the band. It was good. It was a rocking raw thing that was it worked really good. Yeah, let me let me go back on what you just said though. You know, you talk about the special forces logo and and, and that whole concept. You know, President Jimmy Carter had sent in special forces to try to rescue the Iranian hostages, and that ended up with uh, you know a disaster. The the planes got the the helicopters got down. Was Alice aware of that in the sense that he brought that into what the Special Forces concept was? Was that sort of a, an ode to the Special Forces that had tried to save the hostages, do you think? Mm, I have no idea. The, the timing thing, I'm not sure. I know that I remember that Jimmy Carter, they had one of their missions, their first rescue or, or whatever, a rescue mission that involved the helicopters over the desert went badly. Right. I don't know when that was. That was in around the time there. frame of. Okay. I mean, it was around the same time, but I can't remember how if that factored into any of Alice's lyrics or or titles. I couldn't. Okay. I couldn't tell you. Alice, in terms of Alice Cooper, the artist, uh, never really put forth a political point of view. Was he backstage political? That was he. Were there great debates about Democrats and Republicans, or not at all? No. no okay. No, I don't think so. I think that his use of any of those headline political uh, happenings, events, was just was for their headline event status. Okay. Uh, as, as he used to say, you know, he would, he could, he would utilize and get many of his lyrics and or ideas from newspaper headlines and from current status. Like, and I think that's, rather than take a political Republican or Democratic side. It was just the status of an event that it that drew him. I okay. Think. Now there were there were two sort of video documents of that era that that are you know notorious now. First, it was the the appearance on the Tom Snyder show, the uh, Tomorrow Show with Tom Snyder. Were you uh, on that show with Alice? Because he played a couple of songs. Did you play on the? Yeah. Uh, okay. And and that appearance. Mostly is is looked at critically as wow, Alice really looked horrible. It looked as though this was the man on the edge of death. Uh, tell me a little bit about that show and 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 uh, that state of mind and and Tom Snyder, if you can. Well, from my standpoint, at that point, being in the band on the bus, you look at the tour and says we're doing the Tomorrow Show. We're switching, swinging through New York on the bus and it's getting in, uh, and this is the. Uh, the demographics, or this is what's going to happen. Not the demographics, but here's the here's what here's what tomorrow looks like for you. Right. We're doing the Tom Snyder show, and so the bus is going to go, and musicians going to go, and Alice is going to visit. 
So there's no dressing room. There's no backstage. Uh, we're going to get, as I recall, we're going to get dressed. You do that on the bus because it's not, they, don't, they can't accommodate. They'll accommodate Alice, I think, but the whole band and all the gear and all that stuff is too much. So we're going to probably get, we're going to get special permit to get the bus on downtown Manhattan and we're going to get all dressed and we'll just go in and do the, uh, do the, here's the two songs we're going to do. Alice wants to do these two. You go on, and uh, I don't know if there was a sound check or, or the crew did that by themselves with the mic check. And then we went into the building. Uh, uh, then Alice came in, came out of those dressing rooms. We did the two show- songs, and we're gone to the next show. That's what I know about that show. I don't know if I've ever even seen it on television. Well, thanks to YouTube, you can watch it anytime you want now. <laughs> oh, is that right? Yeah. Absolutely. Now you made it sound like it's no fun to watch, though. No, it's fun to watch, but it's you know from a fan's perspective, uh, you know you look at Alice now, and and I, I forget how old he is now. He's you know in his sixties, and he looks like a young twenty-year-old running around. But you look at this that was over thirty years ago, and he looked like a seventy-six-year-old on the verge of of passing away. And you go, wow, how did he allow himself to get into that position where, and, and, you know, it's, it was just shocking to see quite frankly and yeah i've seen some of those shots in the, in the pictures and it looks like you know rough road it really did now the other one that has endured all these years is this alice cooper at paris alice cooper in paris <clears throat> which was filmed for a television uh you know show over there tell me a little bit about that uh event you know the recording of that, and 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 what do you think of the performance? Well, the performance. Well, there was eight. We went to Paris, and there was there was a television show going to do vignettes. Yeah, a visual vignette on uh, ten to twelve songs. I don't quite remember. And they were using the album cuts for some of them, and some live cuts. And I know that we had to. We went in the studio. To, re- to cut five, five or six songs for use in this video because we couldn't do it live at the junkyard. I mean, these on-site, we were, we were in the subway where someone, someone was a, an abandoned car junk yard outside of Paris. There was just no way you could set up and play these songs live. Many of them was videos, like a video. So we went and recorded uh, some songs one evening at Pathé Studios uh, just the way we do them live, no overdubs, just kind of rock them out. And it was quite, those performances were, when you speak of performances, do you mean, is that, is that what you're talking about? Well, I mean, I just, yeah, I'm talking about how... Are you talking the, about the visual? You know, the visual presentation and also, uh, you know, how much of it was actually played live. And and it's, 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 it's too bad that it's never been uh, officially released because that's a great moment in time. I mean, it was a great special. Well, they couldn't, my impressions were there. It became too obvious there when we get with the video makers each morning is they kind of ran out of, out, except for locations, they didn't have a storyboard of, of video, like what they wanted the band or Alice to do, I think. They said, well, we'll do, we'll do the, we'll do Go to Hell on the steps of the Cathedral Montmartre. Now that sounds like a great idea. And then it was. And uh, or we'll do we'll film him doing a song Prius Cop in the Block Block in the red light district of Paris. It sounds great. And then it was. But once you get there, that's where the ideas ran out. It's like, well, what's the band going to do here for the intro? What's the band? How are we going to do? I don't know. They don't know. So as soon as it became apparent that we were just kind of winging it, we'd arrive at the set, and uh, we're going to do this song, the red light district. Okay, it's at nighttime in the Paris. Uh, night has fallen. We're in the red light district of Paris. We're going to do Prius Cap on the block. They've got a couple ambulances there for props. Uh, now what do we do? Okay, that's what. That's now what do we do? Well, then Alice would say, "Well, why don't, why don't we the band do this?" Some of the guys. Would, so that's what it was. It was you know kind of on the loose, on the run every day. It's a new or night, sometimes two in a day. Well, what are we going to do? Who knows? How long did it take to film the special? Was it was it a week? I think I, if memory serves, I remember we did a French tour that was three weeks. You know, I'd have to look at it to see how long it took. Maybe it was a week, maybe it was 10 days. I think mostly we never did, we never could do more than two 
in a day. Many of them were one in a day. For example, the the clones, which was at an abandoned wrecking yard outside of Paris with shredded, razor-sharp, abandoned wrecks everywhere. And it was cold in February. It's below freezing. The wind's blowing. It's raw. And we're going to do what? We're going to do clones. How are we going to do that? You know, it was kind of by flying by the seat of your pants to, the, to some degree. Our impression in the band was that what are we going to do? Nobody knows. You got any ideas? No, I'm sure there was better than that. But from being a member of the troops, you know, I was going, you know, it was, it was, it was very much that. And uh, none of those are live. If you look at the video, you can see that they can't possibly be live. Uh, uh, the, the junk, the school's out. 18 and some of those because we had gone we went that's when i first got involved with the production we went into a stu Pathé studios to record to be honest and faithful to the live renditions the way we did it just to go in and play them the way we did on stage uh which we did in recordings uh but we at least had a little more control over the sonics and it sounded it sounded better than it would in the, if we had tried to do it in the subway in the parisian subway during rush hour or in the red light district <laughs> yeah. at night. But, uh, you can see that that's not going to work. So we did those, you know, I think five or six songs under those conditions. Uh, and that's, and that's, and then it would be a lip sync situation on whatever set they had erected or if it was a live set. So it was, you know, it was guerrilla filmmaking, it seemed to me. I'm amazed that a, a TV channel would fly a band over or get a band for, you know, like you said, a week to 10 days and have no plan. <laughs> just a, well, just well, improvise that, that, something. That, that, they had a plan to a degree. My impression, I don't want to be unfair, but to a degree, I mean, I don't know how well they could story, how to what extreme extent they can storyboard each video out or how much they wanted to. So, I mean, they had a kind of a, an idea of songs, I think. Now, they probably got together with Alice, and I wasn't a party to this, and, and picked songs, and, and and maybe he helped pick in the locations as well. I was never in any of those production Fair meetings enough. for the video. Fair enough. It, it would, of course, be nice to see this officially released uh, somewhere, you know, either on a just a DVD or part of some kind of video box set or video anthology, but uh, it certainly was... Um, uh, you, you know, it was, a, it, was a, it's, it stands the test of time, let's put it that way. You can watch it 30-some years later and go, oh, that was great. That was a lot of fun to watch. Um, so the album itself, Special Forces, doesn't do the numbers that, you know, I'm sure management was hoping for. Only charts in the top 200 of Billboard. You, then you get to work on Zipper Catches Skin. Is there any panic in the Alice Cooper camp of, oh my God, we've got to get back into the top 10? Or was it just like, hey, listen, we'll just, we do what we do and that's sort of all we can do? Well, you got to remember that he's changing bands every two or three years. Yep. And uh, and the first time I joined the band uh, or was picked to join, I was in the band that did the tour of Flesh to Fashion, but not the album. And then, so this, the next album was, you know, so I'm not, I'm not sitting around with Chef Gordon and Alice, and, and they were talking about the career of Alice. You know, I'm, I'm a, a hired bass guy who's pretty good, you know. It's a, you know, and and maybe uh, function as the music director. Of some of this with Dwayne live, and later on when he wanted to make this record, you know, he, he has made records. I remember the day that they picked the band members. I had co-produced a Peter McKeon record, and it was on American Bandstand that morning, and Joe Gannon had seen it, so. You know, I was, so from that standpoint, I was, you know, tapped into to, to maybe, uh, and I said, yeah, I'll help you produce this next thing and we could do this. But from a career planning standpoint and what we can do and the relationship with the label, I have no clue. I'm right. not part of any of those meetings. <laughs> and, but I do know, you know, at the time that uh, there was some, there was, not the, didn't seem to be the most optimum relationship between Shep, Alice, and the Warner Brothers. Right. I mean, I heard like there was a contractual obligation album. There's one or two more or something. But it, it, you know, that there was some tension there. So, did that contribute to maybe Warner Brothers not doing a normal promotional campaign with Alice? Uh, I'm pretty sure it probably did. Yeah. Now, now you write a lot on this album. You, you've got. Uh, let's see here. 
uh, and I've got it in front of me. Zero ax, uh, zero, Zorro's Ascent. Huh. Uh, what else do we have on there? Uh, adaptable, anything for you. I like girls, which we mentioned before. Remarkably insincere. Tag your it. I better be good. And I'm alive. So essentially, you're, you're, you're on eight of the ten tracks. Yeah. Well, at that point, you know, um, we have a relationship there's a trust between, you know, Alice and myself and some of the band members. And so, you know, we're getting together and we're, we're writing. Let's get together and see if we can write some songs at that point. And that's, what, that, that's what's happening. And uh, with some of the members in that band, John Nitzinger wrote a couple of those. And, uh, and I knew a guitar player, Billy Steele, that we brought in for, I think there was a co-writer on Adaptable. Right. And uh, there was an a, a older song that had existed a while before that he had started with Dick Wagner called Make That Money. Yep. And uh, so, yeah, at that point, it was like, you know, we need some songs. At, and I, I know that the label was going, you know, was there was some tension there. There was some you know, problematical relationship between there. But there was a, and I, and I remember hearing the term contractual obligation, we need a record, but they're not going to, you know, I don't know. I was not in any of those meetings, and I don't pretend to know what was going on or to have dictated any of the actions that went down. I knew that there was a record being made, you know. Uh, let's, yeah, let's write some songs with Alice and see if we can make something good. Do you, I mean, and I, and obviously I respect that, that you didn't know all the, the inner workings of management and the record company contract and stuff, but did you get a sense that as you were doing the album that it was being rushed through or it's like, yeah, let's just sort of throw whatever up there and, you know, whatever. Or did Alice still have a commitment to put out the best record he could make? Well, from my standpoint, I'm going to put out the best record we could make. Okay. And, I, you know, I feel like Alice still said the same thing. You know, there was problems. There was different issues going on around in the camp. I could see that. But, I'm, you know... And it's not my place to discuss anybody's private life or the label's relationship with else. I don't know. He's going to make a record. You know, you want to get together and write some songs. And I said, yes, I will see if we can get something that's halfway good and, and get this done. Does he give you any... Inspiration, no. Does he give you any directions when writing songs? Does he say, listen, Alice is a character that needs to do this, this, and this, and lyrically you need to write something that says this, this, and this? Or is it pretty much... Come up with whatever you come up with, and we'll work from there. No, but, well, in, uh, it's about four questions there. Yep. As far as lyrics, he writes all the lyrics. Okay, so you're just doing uh, the music. I, yeah, okay. we're doing the music. And uh, there were I know, remember there was a time when, as far as the arrangement of one of the songs, I wanted to do a thing with a guitar, that a 12-string pattern. And he looked at me and he said, have you heard that before? And I went, well, yes, I've heard that type of thing on a, on a bird's record or on this, on a whatever. And he said, well, then, you know, Alice is not a follower. He's a leader. You know, if you heard it before, you know, Alice does. He very much wanted to be on the cutting edge. And this was uh, <clears throat> during, at least the zipper was during the new age punk, like I, I mentioned. And he uh, arguably was one of the earliest first punks. So he wanted to lead that charge. That's why there's no echo, almost no echo on that record. It's very lean. Yep. Uh, approach, which is what he wanted to do, uh, and so absolutely from that standpoint, you know, it's uh, he's in charge. I sometimes look back at it and go, you know, I wish I was, I think it could have been, but yeah, he was, uh, you know, he wanted to do it this way, and wanted to be the punkiest punk, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and deservedly so. And he wrote the lyrics, and so you know, we worked within the parameters that he wanted to do. You also worked uh, later on. So, you know, at the end of uh, Zipper Catch a Skin, you go on, did, did you go on tour with Alice for that album? No. That, you know, it, it, there, was a certain, there was a certain crisis point between labels and management and probably private lives at that point. For whatever reason, he took a break from touring and that band dissolved. We went our separate ways. So there was no support whatsoever behind Zipper. Nothing at all. Huh? And And so... Um, when the band dissolves, how has that happened? For, for, do you get a, you know, a pink slip that says you're fired, or do, do, they, do they call you and say, hey, sorry, or do you just pick up the uh, Circus magazine and say, hey, 
data is out. Why wasn't I invited to this? How does how does that work? Oh, it depends on the situation. You know, if you know some of the some of the players are in are, have closer relationships with you know, people involved with management or with Alice or the label and stuff. I know that Alice has taken some time off. Okay. And uh, so that's it. You know, so I'm looking for you know work. Everybody else is looking for different projects to happen. Uh, that's it. No, there's no pink slips. There's no gathering where you all get together like it's a company, like it's just, you know, it's, right. Alice has taken some time off. Haven't you heard? Not everybody hears that stuff. You know, you're going, are we doing this? Alice going out? No, there's not going to be a tour. You know, he's taking some time off. So that album is not going to get its day in court, either, no. uh, whether, you know, on whatever, for, for whatever reason. Was that uh, disappointing to you after having written a large bulk of the music for this album that it's not going to be toured? Were, were there any hard feelings there? No hard feelings. It's the business, you know, right. the business we have chosen. Sometimes that shit happens. It just goes down and it's not going to, you know, there was a few things on there that were interesting. I mean, like if I, you know, I would have probably done more a wetter album, a more different, slightly sonic approach. But Alice's direction wanted it the leanest, meanest, Right. He, he's, the, he's the leader of the punk. So if whatever punk movement is out there, he started it, and he wants to reassume the leadership position. That's the the mandate I get handed down. So, okay, let's make this the leanest, meanest. There's no echo. Everything is sharp-edged and just a street gang mean, you know. And so that's what we did. And to that, and there's some there's a few things on there that's... Uh, that I can listen to, and, you know, not cringe. I like them. And so it would have been nice to have something... You know, you don't work on something for months or years. In this case, it was months, not years. But, of course, you like to hear your stuff get a, at least a fair day in court. Yeah, absolutely. Now, a- after that, uh, you know, after the band disbanded and people went their separate ways, you came back and worked uh, for Alice or with Alice on a few compilation albums, the uh, Prince of Darkness, the uh, Mascara and Monsters, the Life and Crimes. Um what were your roles in in the compilations? Is it just sort of you, you're sifting through the tapes and figure which songs are the best to go on this, or are you doing anything to them? Are you adjusting them? In None any of way? that. None of that high end decision making. Okay. But how that happens after that period of time? I remember Alice called and said Joe Perry was a friend, and they were up, he was up at Alice's house, and they were kicking around some music. You want to come up? And, we'll, and I said sure, love to. I haven't met Joe. Opened a. a a few shows on the Alice tour uh, when his solo act, he had right. separated from Aerosmith at the time. And so right. but I didn't really know him except that he's a nice guy. Yeah. I'd love to go jam with Joe Perry and maybe we can write some. So we came out with a few things, uh, that night and maybe there was a second night and then I went away and they did their thing. And then, um, I, uh, I saw it on a record later. So I wasn't, didn't, you know, uh, uh, outside that session and that, that writing session and however far we got, and somebody else put it together and decided that it should go on this uh, uh, Monsters or, mess or that stuff. That was after the, you know, so that's it. That's my contribution. We got together and wrote some music and did some stuff, and then later I saw it, and I'll, it made an album. Okay. So, now, what do you do after? Not in you... charge of that one, Mitch. Not in charge at all, huh? <laughs> no, I just got there, wrote some music with Joe and Alice, and later I see, oh, I made a record. Cool. Yeah, there you go. And I'm trying to find, um, what was the, uh, were you part of that song for Britain only? Yes. To tell me a little bit about that one, because that was, I think as the title says, it was written for, for Britain only. Uh, Americans didn't get to hear it until the uh, box set came out. What was the purpose of that song? How you, there, I can tell you about this one because this was following uh, the su- successful tour of the UK in the spring of 1982 or late winter. We did a tour of the UK then it went off really well and then Alice apparently and the powers that be at Warner Brothers UK decided to make some sort of a commemoration uh, record and so we did they picked three songs that we had recorded live on that tour the I figure which one was under the, my wheels, and there's two others. Right. And then he said, "Let's write a song for this uh, this EP, and we'll call it and I'll call it, let's call it for Britain only." And so we got together, the band. We were still 
on tour. We're still in, in England, and we got together and, and had some writing, tossed ideas back and forth, and uh, and that's how the music. And he liked this piece of music that I think me and Nitzinger had kind of come up with, and uh, and we developed that into. Uh, he wrote words, and then we developed that into that song and recorded it. And it became uh, for Britain only, and it was, I guess, literally for Britain only as a yes. commemoration thing. It was released over there, and uh, oh, here it is. Yes, who do you think we are? Live, my old citizen, under my wheels, and the for Britain only, which was a studio cut. Yeah, you know, I, and I got to hear it after it came out on the box. It's a great song. Are there other songs in those years? Uh, you know, special forces years, and 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 flush the fashion that you recorded with Alice that you know have not seen the light of day or are sitting in a vault somewhere? You know, I'm not sure, to be honest. Uh, this goes back to the, uh, you said the monsters and the, the mascara and the other one, Prince of Darkness. Yeah. Um, the making or the deciding of making those, I wasn't a part of that. My uh, involvement was we'd get together, like I say, this one night was a, uh, for two nights, and I was Joe Perry and Alice up to his house. We wrote some stuff, and Alice was always very good at giving credit uh, to the people who helped create stuff. So, and later, whenever it was decided, whenever they made those records or whether it was contract or whatever the deal was, uh, he looks, let's do this song that uh, Eric and Joe and I started, uh, you know, six months ago, and, uh, and then he would. Whatever songs, however they arrived at the decision to use that material, but he was always really good at remembering where that material started. And, he, and uh, you get a songwriting credit if you were there when, and you were you helped write that song. Now the other thing uh, that you did after that, you were part of Sonia Data. Yeah, band did quite well actually. Uh, you know, you went up to number two on the Australian charts. Um, Let's talk a little bit about that band. Uh, how did that come together? Um, I had done an album, Idle Tears, uh, with Dan Pritzker, who was, who, was a, who was a writer, great writer, as a matter of fact, in 86. And then in 90, uh, he was kept looking for singers, and he found these the three singers, uh, Paris Delane, Michael Scott, and Sam Hogan, who were singing, busking, as it's termed, uh, outside the Chicago subway. They get there at certain rush hours and sing, and they sang great gospel uh, type of. Well, you couldn't help being gospel because they're. Uh, and so that band, he says, I got, I've got a singer, or I'm, no, actually, I don't have a singer. I have three singers, and uh, you want to come by and let's see if we can do something. So, Dave Resnick and I were in Los Angeles, went to Chicago, and for a week, we with these singers wrote and did some material, and that ended up. Uh, Dan liked it, and he said, this is, everybody agreed that this was an unusual collision of cultures and musicians and backgrounds. Some were rock and R&B like myself, some were psychedelic. Dan was a big Deadhead fan, and the singers, of course, come from the R&B gospel world, and uh, the drummer, Hank Wally, and now come from a jazzy sort of a... So this collision of cultures and disparate musical personalities was making something that was fresh sounding and unique to us and so and Dan is the main writer again he wrote all the lyrics the contributions from the rest of us were from a musical standpoint and uh, so we started this out and the first album went it was on you we were signed to I think Electra Asylum worldwide except for Australia right. so in Australia the album the single started to break and we went down there and at one point we had singles at number one and number three and we were trying to get number one and two because that hadn't been done since Paperback Writer and Rain by the Beatles. Wow. And we, uh, so we had a great, the album made it to two and we had singles at one and three. And then we came back and <clears throat> toured the United States and um, had, uh, you know, we did six albums, I think, and in some areas were, did really well and, cause, and in some areas not as well. Uh, again, labels, Label problematical relationships with recording labels and contracts led to uh, that album. The single that had made number one was the most played song of the year down in Australia in 1993. Wow. Uh, the label didn't follow through with it here, 
so it was a regional hit as opposed to a national hit. But we did the band did quite well, especially based on live performances. It was good. So, you know, we had a 15 year run, and it was a, an interesting collection of, you know, most bands, many bands have a singer or a communicator, and we had three great singers. From the, so it was unusual from that standpoint to have such vocal prominence in, in a band that would uh, that would occasionally veer. I used to read the reviews and they'd say it was the, the collision, the Temptations meet the Zeppelin meet the, the Grateful Dead with some jazz and folk thrown in. So it was just no rules from a stylistic standpoint, uh, which we enjoyed greatly. We knew we were making something very eclectic. It was not like, you know, this song is similar to the other eight on the record. Well, not at all. If you don't like this acoustic song here, the next one is psychedelic rock. So I, I, I love the freedom, the yeah. artistic freedom in that band. And we had great success. And you can talk to a lot of people live that that was, in some cases, as good as it got. Do you think the band will, will ever play together again? Sonia Dada? Yeah. And you know, it's hard to tell. A lot of people ask because we got a fairly comprehensive fan base, uh, although it's spread out all over the place. You know, I, hard to tell. Hard to tell. You know, Dan's making a movie now about the birth of jazz. It's a, it's a, it's a major undertaking. Everybody else is doing their their own thing. You know, some some of it uh, less prominent. You know, I've, I, the last couple. Uh, after 40 years of touring and recording as a, a more conventional bass player in a group, I, the last two solo albums I've done are kind of rule-breaking, genre, unclassifiable music, especially since I used the electric bass to, uh, in non-traditional, conventional ensemble roles. I'll play the lead, or I'll play a banjo parts on it. And, so it's, an ex- it, it's a... It's unclassifiable. What's called sometimes world, sometimes new age, sometimes this. It's, yeah. it, it has done me no good from a marketing standpoint to be so wildly eclectic. But uh, <laughs> the freedom is good, you know. I'm in my sixties now, so it's, it, it's I get to make some very creative music, and that's part of you know what being an artist and a musician is about. Not just following the rules to so get a corporate airplay. Well, no, and and uh, y- you know. Corporate airplay is is fine and all, but at the same time, uh, having that freedom to to do what one feels is right or feels good is, I think, is more rewarding, more enriching, quite frankly. I've kind of gravitated towards this. If you look at my career over the years, now, now Flo and Eddie as the Turtles, yeah. there was nothing more commercial and pop than their great Turtles hits. But then they went to join Zappa, which was a total different, and then left on their own as Flo and Eddie. It was a whole different... Well, have you ever seen them live? I've never seen Flo and Eddie live. It, it's not a band that really made its way up to Canada, or at least not in my consciousness. I mean, uh, you know, I've not alive. We played the Macumbo a couple. Well, no, it's but it's it's eclectic. It's different. Have you ever heard of Tony OK? Yeah, but I haven't seen him either. It's wild. Well, he's wild too. If Warren Zevon hadn't broke that uh, sort of barrier of Werewolves of London of uncommercial sort of unexpected not uncommercial is the wrong word but unexpected genre defying stuff and then there's Alice of course so I've always kind of gravitated towards the not the pop not the commercial pop but the uh, the FM if you will <laughs> yeah yeah you know uh, when we started this I said how long do you want to go and you said oh you'll probably get bored of me after 15 minutes but we're five minutes away from doing an hour Believe it or not. Well, I hope it doesn't. Sometimes and I'm, and I... I'm still not done. I mean, I, I could go <laughs> on, but uh, you know, we probably should wrap it up within the next ten minutes. But uh, we should talk about uh, the the new album and the Earth Bleeds, and we should also talk quickly about having written for um, movies. You did some. Oh yeah. Well, you know, as a, as a, as a musician. Uh, you're either if the first rock band you're in, you know everybody had their first rock band, and if that band turns out to be Guns N' Roses or has success, boom, then you're in that band, you're in that genre, and you can have a career. You can do that for the next forty years, even if you don't have a hit after the first or second album. You're playing state fairs, doing that stuff, 
it was me. It just, you know, I was, the solo stuff was always critically acclaimed, but not commercial enough. So then I'd go, fortunately, I had the good fortune to work with, you know, stars and some, some yeah. internationally legitimate artists. And I would do that. And then that would stop. It's like, you know, Alice is going to take time off now. Or Flo and they stopped making original music and they became a legacy act doing the turtles and stuff. And I, well, I didn't want to do that. I had, I want to create new stuff. I've always wanted to create new stuff as opposed to play sessions or, I, I, I mean, I like, I love recording, but I want to be a part of the creative process, make the thing, make the record, and then tour behind that because you've got ownership in it. This is part of what you do. You helped create this thing, and now you go out in public and stand up and admit it. Yeah, I helped <laughs> create this thing, and now I'm going to play it in front of you. And uh, that, so that's you know, kind of sorry, that's interesting. I've never heard anybody sort of say you have to admit it. That that's a very great quote right there. That's, <laughs> yeah, I I created this. I, I, you know, but I guilty. guess uh, guilty. But uh, you know, you get you get the accolades, and sometimes uh, you also get the uh, the criticism. But uh, uh, to take ownership of it like that, and that that's that's a very uh, interesting way to put it. Yeah, I, li I like that. That was good. Yeah. Well, it's. I, if you, the sessions, I don't, I'm not, I don't really have the personality to, you go in there and the guys that can come up, they, they play back in the old days, at least, you know, the, the session cats were obviously very accomplished musicians enough to go in there and play competent parts, at least on records, you know, three times a day. But sometimes that wasn't, it wasn't about the personality. It was generally commercial hits song-driven commercial hits for the Monkees or for David Cassidy or for Mama's or for anybody. But I've always kind of gravitated towards the personality stuff. I've been more interested in, in, in the writing and the creating of something like that and, uh, and then playing it as opposed to, you know, it's just, uh, that's what makes me tick. To a degree, a session, if you read, and I can't read, and I don't say that proudly, but if you if your career is at a reading musician, you are accomplished. You go to school, you get my respect. You can go in there and read this stuff, and that's amazing. But it's not creative to me. You go in there and you're you're playing what somebody else wrote, what somebody else created, mm -hmm. and you're a you're a copy machine. You're a typewriter, and it's hard. But it's it lacks a certain creative input that is always attracted me to this business to begin with. I want to create the stuff and come up with this and listen to what I can do on this space. I'm playing a banjo line in the upper registers, and then I'm going to overdub this this part that would normally would be a slide guitar, and I'll put echo on delay on it in the upper registers, and it's going to have a different sound because it's on the bass, and it's got this baritone kind of guitar upper registries with echo. It's It sounds different, and I'm proud of that. And I like that. To me, that's what creative, that's what art is. There shouldn't be any rules in art. Should yeah, no, there? No, there shouldn't. And and I like the fact that your collection, of, your body of work is somewhat eclectic. It's It's gone, like you said, from the the, the, the punk rock of Alice Cooper to, boy, the, the, the what do you want to call it? The new world or world music of And the Earth Bleeds and, and all that. It's, it's, you know, it's great stuff. Uh, Eric, this has been a pleasure. We we we've reached the one hour mark, believe it or not. <laughs> um, we should, of course, tell folks to go to ericscottbass.com dot com and and you know check out the uh, the solo albums. Uh, we've got what we've got uh, other planets, and the Earth bleeds. Uh, anything else coming up with any other bands or? Well, at the moment, there's always little things here. You're trying to write a song for a friend who's doing a movie. Trying to do this. Trying to do that. I'm at the moment. I'm kind of. I'm pr trying to make, as an independent artist, you know, it, it's imp It's very expensive to go tour. You put the band together and you go. To, that's and that's that's hard to do, especially with new stuff that people don't know. It's not like they're people going to go flock to see you perform your hit record. So I'm doing this kind of online. I made one video of one of the songs called Free that consists primarily of images I took in Scotland, and then I'm doing two other videos. One's animated. And that I hope for, you know, I hope for some, I hope that it comes out successfully and, and it's also entertaining. But it's primarily with me now being an independent solo kind of a guy, I'm trying to do most of this at this point online. Yep. So. It's the way to go. That, that's, well, I don't know if it's the way to go, but that's the way, that's the only way I can do it right now. And so I'm promoting End Years Bleeds. 
Uh, and there are bits of it at that site, and also the Facebook page, which is Eric Scott, A.K.A. Esky. And I'm thinking about making another one, a, a record that's just that's. I'm not going to say the instrumental. It it is a more unconventional collaboration of instruments than you would normally hear. So I, I won't say who it involved or what it involved, because then somebody else will beat me to it, and I'll be a copycat instead of a creator. Right. You know, a, a few years ago, Dick Wagner released a songwriter's version album of the stuff he had done with Alice Cooper. At some point, I, I, I would certainly, as a fan, love to hear a songwriter's version of the work that you did with Alice and the songs you wrote with him, your your interpret interpretations of those uh, songs. But Wow. The thing... The thing that probably about that, those are so those are more Alice than they are Eric Scott, though. I mean, when you write all the words in yourself, and you're, you know, I'm trying to give him something that he will be happy with, and that's representative of him, honestly, of of, of what the artist of what Alice is. And so for me, you know, it's not as if I wrote this and then Alice interpreted it this way, and I, here's what I really meant. You know, <laughs> I don't I don't have those so much. Those are those are pretty much Alice songs. Well, there you go. Well, thank you. This has been an absolute uh, pleasure, and um, you know, it, it's been a great hour. Absolutely, been a great hour. Well, thank you, Mitch. I hope it. I hope it stands up, and when you listen to it later. <laughs> oh yeah, it will. And uh, I, I'm sure Alice fans out there are going to want to hear this because, uh, you know, those those albums in those years are misunderstood and. Coming out of the 70s, where Alice was larger than life, and then when you got back to the Trash album uh, and what happened after Alice regained and became again sort of larger than life, that 80s music, even the stuff in 86 and 87, gets overlooked so much, and um, it, it's too bad. There's a lot of great music that people really need to check out. Well, well, thank you. The, the, the fans that have a case that, that chip in and appreciate those albums, they always seem to mention the fact of the energy and the raw yes. uh, strength of the band playing. And uh, so I, I do appreciate that. Well, great. Well, thank you, Eric. Been a pleasure. And thank you, Mitch. Absolutely. What you just heard was Mitch's interview with Eric Scott here on One on One with Mitch LaFon. Nice job, Mitch. Thank you. It was great talking to Eric. And it was, you know, what was great about that is that he reached out to me through Facebook. He's, oh, I think cool. his wife or somebody has been following some of the interviews I've done. And he said, hey, I've got a story to tell. Can, can I come on and tell it? And he, listen, I'm an Alice Cooper fan. So anything that's in that realm, I'm in. And it, right it was on. a great story. And, uh, you know, I certainly hope everybody enjoyed it. And of course, check out And the Earth Bleeds. Um, we will link his website, by the way, guys, through today's show notes on TalkingMetal.com in the one-on-one -on -one section. This episode of One-on-One -on -one is, of course, brought to you by Melodic Rock Fest 4, taking place October 3rd and 4th in Arlington Heights, Illinois, and features performances by Mitch Malloy, Seventh Heaven, Talon, Pauline, Bombay Black, and Heaven's Edge, a band, of course, that I think you like quite a bit, Mark. I used to go see Heaven's Edge play at the... Empire Rock Club in Philadelphia. Oh it my. was just right over the city line border, but it was in an area of Philly that was very, I guess I would call it, a, it had a very suburban feel to it. You almost didn't really feel like you were in downtown Philly or anything, but the Empire Rock Club was a, a, just an amazing club where I would see everything from, you know, glam, pop metal to thrash metal. I remember seeing Flotsam and Jetsam play there, and I also oh remember seeing at least twice possibly three times heaven's edge and i gotta tell you the thing i remember about heaven's edge besides liking their music a lot was the club was just packed with girls i mean just beyond ridiculous and that's uh that's what the scene was like back in those days but um and if all goes band, i was just gonna say if all goes well you'll have heaven's edge on talking metal at some point it sounds like th that might happen we're still working on that that, that would be great I, i'd actually like to know why they went from sold out shows to where they are now why why they didn't have that breakthrough what what happened was it a record company something i don't know, so I we'll don't forget. know. and of course uh, let's let's just remind folks that for all information about melodic rock fest for head over to melodicrockfest.com and i'll finish by saying 
I have a new A World With Heroes Kiss tribute EP fe featuring six new songs by The Killer Dwarves, Matt Bradshaw, Crash Kelly featuring Sean Kelly of 4 by Fate, and of course Dick Wagner with all the money heading over to the Vaudreuil Soulange Palliative Care Home in Hudson, Quebec. Head over to iTunes and pick up the A World With Heroes EP. And while you're there, check out the uh, full album that I did last year, Kiss, a 40th anniversary tribute called A World With Heroes. Pick them both up. You'll, you'll, you'll have hours and hours of fun listening to great Kiss Definitely. covers. There you go. We've done Very another good. one. Yes, sir. Thank you. I will talk to you next time, Mitch. Absolutely. See you next week. <laughs>